Okay. okay, for anybody who doesn't know me, and I doubt that there's anybody here in that category, um, this, this uh, slide set that I'm using today is adapted from what I use with my students every fall when I teach um, antebellum U.S. history. And I like to work in local events, local practice whenever I can. And um, I came across uh, these stories of unknown, unsung, largely unsung heroes uh, from central New York. Um, this is all based up in Syracuse, but that's close enough to, to be local. So, and the salt and light theme, I'll, uh, I've already told Glenn I'm doing this. I'm completely stealing it from his sermon last Sunday. <laughs> he, he actually said he was, he was quite pleased, so. Um, Syracuse was a real hotbed of anti-slavery agitation, and we're going to look at three stories. The story of Harriet Powell, Jermaine Logan, and the story of Jerry's rescue. And if you want to get information on my sources, uh, I'll be happy to pass this along. There is a terrific website uh, at, through the Syracuse University Library that has a lot, of this, uh, a lot of documents and these stories on there. And there's also a terrific little monograph. It's very, very short. Um, <clears throat> Angela Murphy, who's from all places, Texas, came up to Syracuse. Somehow she'd heard this story. And she's written a fabulous book that takes the story of Jerry's rescue in 1851 and uses it as a way of helping to understand the Fugitive Slave Act and the Compromise of 1850 and a whole bunch of American history that was happening right then through the lens of a very, very exciting and dramatic uh, rescue of a fugitive slave. So. We're going to start with the U.S. Constitution, because what I really want us to think about today is every story I'm going to tell is about people who broke the law. Every single one of these was very illegal and carried great risk of fines and or imprisonment. And I want us to think about what is justice, what's just, and I also want us to think about in deep in our hearts, would we have the courage to break the law for what we might consider a higher good? And so we'll start with the U.S. Constitution because all of our stories today are based in Article 4, Section 2. That no person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from service or labor, it shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such labor or service may be due. Now this is really convoluted because they were doing everything possible to avoid the word slave. If you remember your U.S. history class, the word slave does not appear in the Constitution ever. It's, the concept is talked about, but the word slave is never mentioned. And so people held to service or labor are could be indentured servants, but are really slaves. Um, if they escape, they are not supposed to be free. They are supposed to be returned to their slave owner. And that slave owners have the right to chase their fugitive slaves anywhere in the ground, you know, in the bounds of the United States. Now, the Constitution's great, but it's not um, a law. I mean, it, it's not an enactable, enforceable law. So in 1793, who would, have, who would have had the right to place them in uh, service? Well, under, it says under the laws thereof. So the states that had slavery, which in 1787 was all of them, any person held to service under the laws of one state, meaning that slavery was legal in that state mm -hmm. and they were slaves under that law, if they escaped to another state, the owners have the right to go after them. Mm -hmm. And the people of those states are obligated to um, give them up mm -hmm. and send them back. The 1793 Fugitive Slave Act uh, enacted that uh, part of the Constitution. And I've only given you a small excerpt of the law, which is the uh, penalty. Um, and if you come right on down, uh, shall forfeit and pay the sum of five hundred dollars. Now five hundred dollars in seventeen ninety three was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. For most poor people it would be 
a year's or more salary. Could be much more than that. So it's a huge amount of money for any average person and a noticeable amount of money even for rich people. So the question I have for us is, under those conditions, should Christians try to assist fugitive slaves? Is the penalty worth the freedom of a single human being? That is the question Christians were asking themselves in light of the 1793 law. And working under the provisions of that law, my first story is of a young woman named Harriet Powell. Harriet Powell was a slave from Mississippi. And like a higher percentage of slaves than we want to think, she looked white. Fair skin, brown hair, brown eyes. Um, and she was a personal slave to a family named Davenport. And the Davenports were visiting Syracuse for an extended period of time and hoping to deal with it. There were some business deals involved. And Mr. Davenport, knowing he was going to be gone for quite a while, brought his whole family with him. And they brought Harriet up to be their personal servant. Now, that was very normal for wealthier families to do in that day. Harriet gets, they check into the hotel in Syracuse. And Harriet immediately begins interacting with the hotel staff. And the hotel staff were very used to working with the personal servants of their, of their patrons. This was a normal thing. But in interacting with the hotel staff, the, the hotel staff, some of whom is white, some of whom is black, uh, assume that Harriet is a hired servant because she looks white. And are appalled when they find out that she is a slave. And this being Syracuse, hotbed of abolitionist agitation, the first question they find out, ask her when they find out she's a slave is, well, do you want your freedom? We can do that. And much to their amazement, she hesitates and says, um, I don't think so. You don't think so? And she says, well, my mother's getting older, and I have a, very, a much younger sister at home and they rely on me to care for them and if I run away I'll never see them again and they said well we get that family's really big for all of us we get that but if you change your mind we can pull this off with very little notice so within the next I don't know how long few days Harriet's going about her business working for the Davenport's and as servants do, she overhears things. And what she overhears is the plan to sell her. She's pretty. She's young. And she will command absolute the topest dollar to be some rich man's fancy lady. I don't think I need to explain what that most likely entails. If you need it, talk to me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> this is church after all. Um, So she realizes she's going to be sold away from her mother and sister, and she will never see them again anyway. And she's going to be the sex slave of some guy in the South. That's where she's going to be sold for. Oh, God. She goes back to the folks in the hotel staff and says, I've changed my mind. Can we do this? I'm going to lose them anyway. And I'd much rather have my freedom. And they said, give us... You know, the Davenports were, were not leaving immediately, so there was a, not a huge hurry. They said, give us, a, give us a day or so to make the arrangements. And they come back to her a little bit later and says, tonight's your evening out, right? She did have an evening out that she could go out a little bit. And she said, yeah. And they said, so leave at 7 o'clock. Have your bonnet and take with you anything you want to take with you to freedom. And when you get kidnapped, Scream really good and pretend that you have no clue what's happening. And sure enough, that evening she put on her bonnet, she took her little bag, her purse that had a few mementos in it, and she snatched off the streets of Syracuse and she shoved it into a carriage that has all the uh, uh, co uh, windows covered with dark paper or cloth. And she screams. And it's just very dramatic. And as soon as they get going, they probably had trouble not laughing too hard because, you know. Um, of course it was staged, and she knew exactly what was happening. 
And, uh, but they made it look really convincing. And um, Harriet was never seen in Syracuse again. The Davenports uh, realized she's not coming back. Of course, they heard all about the kidnapping. The staff made sure everybody heard about the kidnapping. Is it a terrible women stashed off the streets of Syracuse? <laughs> and they put out a $200 reward, which is a <coughs> amount of money. Um, and uh, the, the, one of the funniest things about this story is that right the first place they took her in that carriage the night they snatched her is they took her to the uh, little town of Peterborough outside of Syracuse, and she hid in the house of Garrett Smith. Garrett Smith was a very wealthy landowner, timber guy in central New York, and he used most of his money to support abolition. He was a very ardent abolitionist. And they took him to Garrett Smith's house. And pretty soon, everybody's like, uh, Mr. Smith, they're going to be looking for her here, because you are like the best known abolitionist in the area. And so they, she was only there one, maybe two nights, just while they were making arrangements. And she left Mr. Smith's house. And they got her up to the St. Lawrence, across the river, to the community of St. Catharines. St. Catharines Canada, uh, in Ontario was a freed slave community that had been bankrolled by both American and Canadian abolitionists. And the Underground Railroad, if it went over to Canada, most of those people either went to Kingston or to St. Catharines. Both of the places had um, community, had, had communities set up where they bring uh, a new fugitive in, and the first thing is, is make sure they've got adequate clothes. Canada's a tad cooler than Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> a tad. Um, they get them to school and start working on their literacy. If they had a trade, they find them jobs in that trade. If they didn't, they get them into a training program. Um, and most of this was done by people who were themselves fugitives and had settled in Canada and then devoted their lives to helping the next groups after them. Where were they fugitives from? The uh, any fugitive slaves who took the Underground Railroad and came up, uh, most of the successful fugitives tended to be from border states because it was really hard to travel through multiple states in the deep <coughs> south to get to freedom. But there were free people who made the way to freedom from uh, all over, and including especially the border states, but even like Harriet, eventually from deeper south, had that opportunity. By a border state, you mean Virginia? Or, uh, Virginia, Virginia, Maryland, Maryland Missouri, Missouri uh, Kentucky, um, right along the Mason Dixon line. Uh, some from somewhat further south than there, but once you got to, say, the Gulf Coast. Even then you got some, because sometimes they stowed away and then made their way once they got the ships. around, you know, up, up to mm -hmm. north of the Mason-Dixon line. Um, and that's why the Underground Railroad, by the way, was underground, because anybody who got caught participating faced that $500 fine, which, as I said, for most families, even up through the Civil War, would bankrupt you, plus the shame of, um, you know, being a felon. Um, Harriet, so Harriet escapes to Canada, to St. Catharines. Um, she gets in really involved with the free slave community there. A white abolitionist couple hire her because the only thing she knows how to do to support herself is domestic service, which she's done all of her life. And so they hired her to be their maid, making sure that she got to church on Sunday and making sure that she never missed school. Her schedule, they arranged around and, and to make sure she got plenty of social time in St. Catharines so that she could develop friends and, and, uh, and for a nice, attractive young girl, frankly, they were trying to help her find a husband. Uh, and she did find a, a very nice husband through the ca uh, community at St. Catharines. And I don't remember how long she lived, but she lived and had a family and lived for many years as a happy, free woman in Canada. So my questions on this is, those who assisted or broke the law, they risked arrest and a fine. Was breaking this law an example of lawlessness or of Christian love? The Davenports had one belief, Garrett Smith had another. The second person I want to introduce you to is Jermaine Wesley Logan. 
Born into slavery in Tennessee, he was a mixed race uh, because his father was his mother's owner, uh, a guy named Logue. Uh, Jermaine changed his name from Jarm Logue to Jermaine Wesley Logan uh, when he became free. Um, after multiple attempts at escaping with his mother's assistance, he escaped at the age of 21 by stealing his master's horse, which the master never forgave him for. Uh, eventually settles in Syracuse, becomes a pastor of an uh, AME, African Mer uh, Methodist Episcopal Church in Syracuse, and he becomes a station master of the Underground Railroad, which in Syracuse was not underground. Mr. Logan, Reverend Logan, ran regular ads in the abolitionist papers in Syracuse that if you find any fugitives, here's my address, bring them to my house, and I will make sure they are taken care of. And he did. Uh, some chose to settle in upstate New York, and uh, some chose to move on to Canada, and he worked with um, to make sure they were where they wanted to be. Uh, spoke widely throughout upstate New York of his experiences as a slave, uh, was a leading abolitionist speaker. And in 1859, in fact, he published his autobiography um, and made no secrets of the fact that he was a fugitive. So with that background, we now come to the most onerous of the Fugitive Slave Act, Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Uh, it was part of the Compromise of 1850, which was trying to settle the <laughs> slavery and versus abolition agitation to try to prevent the Civil War. It did hold it off for another 10 years. Um, if you want to know more about the Compromise of 1850, talk to me afterwards, because that would take the next three hours. Um, but the part I wanted to share with you is the fact that the fine has gone up. It's now $1,000 and imprisonment of up to six months. <clears throat> much more dramatic fine, much harsher penalty uh, for helping fugitives. So what's a Christian supposed to do? And again, is the risk worth the lives of oppressed human beings? I'm sure there were some people that had been assisting the Underground Railroad who took a look at that and pulled out. But many more got angry enough that they jumped in. And that's going to bring us to uh, our next uh, culminating story. Because well, in they, May of 18... They, <laughs> the, the law, these laws were, what, state laws? They were federal or, laws. Or federal laws. They were federal laws. laws. Mm. And... Uh, would, and have it, been, would it have been passed by the Congress? And, it was passed by the Congress and signed yeah. by the President, yes. Oh. In 1851... Daniel Webster, who had helped craft the Compromise of 1850 when he was in the Senate, had become Secretary of State in the meantime between when that law was passed in uh, the spring of 1851. And there is so much resentment about the Fugitive Slave Act. Uh, I've got slides of this big, long speech that Jermaine Logan gave at an anti-Fugitive Slave Act rally in Syracuse after it was passed where he basically tells the people of Syracuse, I love you, I trust you, and I will not, and you will not sell me out, will you? Yes? Now, I was wondering, is that law, was that law applicable to all the states yes. of the Union? Yes, yes, it was and, a federal law. And how did the southern states get around it? The several states wanted it. They're the ones who insisted on it. That was their contribution. They wanted their fugitives to be caught and brought back down to the, to, to the south. The, the Fugitive Slave Act was a <laughs> southern invention. They wanted their slaves returned because too many of them were running away. And they wanted them back, so they made the penalties for assisting fugitives much tougher. So and you're it, saying that that law originated from the southern states. Yes, that was there. Yeah, to yeah, that was that was put in the Compromise of 1850 to appease the Southerners, and because they wanted their slaves back. Too many of them are running away and getting and going north and getting assistance to get to Canada or to um, more northern climates where they can stay. So yeah, it's the, it's the southern states that want the Fugitive Slave Act. And the northern states are rebelling. 
one of the things, there was a uh, 1841 case, Prigg versus Pennsylvania, that dealt with personal liberty laws. Many of the northern states, after they outlawed slavery, went one step further and declared that anybody who made it into their states automatically a free person and cannot be taken back to slavery, and the Supreme Court invalidated those laws, <coughs> saying that the, com the Constitution and the Federal Fugitive Slave Act superseded those state laws. Pencil and Pennsylvania had one, and that's how Prigg versus Pennsylvania uh, ended up in the Supreme Court. Okay, 1851, Daniel Webster becomes Secretary of State, and he gives a series of speeches in all of the abolitionist cities of upstate, Rochester, Buffalo, Syracuse, Utica. And in Syracuse, he promises that he will enforce the Fugitive Slave Act in Syracuse. He tells the good citizens of Syracuse that if they try to stop it, they are committing treason, which carries the death penalty. And he is in any necessity, <coughs> will prosecute them for treason. And that he promises he will execute the Fugitive Slave Law in Syracuse in the midst of the next anti-slavery convention, which was scheduled for October. Much of the New York fugitive community fled the state. Frederick Douglass went to England and raised money for uh, causes for at least six months, if not a year. Took some of his family with him. Uh, Harriet Tubman took her family with the help of uh, William Seward, if you're familiar with him, he was uh, senator, governor, and eventually secretary of state. Seward's Folly back in Alaska in 1867. If you've seen the movie Lincoln, he's in almost every scene because he was Lincoln's right-hand man. Uh, the Seward's were very close personal friends of the Tubman, of the Harriet Tubman, and gave her the, uh, sold her because she insisted on buying it, uh, the land for her house, which is now a national park site uh, near Auburn. And the, many people like the Sewards, like went to Terry and said, how much money do you need? You're going to Canada. We're not going to risk letting you be arrested and sent back to slavery. And so Terry and her whole family went to Canada for at least six months. Jermaine Logan is going to be brave and he's telling his wife oh, and, his, and his church and his friends, he says, I'm not leaving Syracuse. Syracuse will never let me be taken. And they're like, dude. Don't be stupid. <laughs> How much money do you need? We've got it. Just get out of here. You are target number one. Mm -hmm. After all, he was the main after he was the main fugitive slavery. Was preaching about it all over upstate New York. And his wife, who was freeborn, um, stayed in Syracuse and ran the Underground Railroad station. Members of his church stepped <laughs> up uh, to take care of the church while he. Uh, and uh, at least one of his older sons went to Canada for six months and used it very effectively raising money among Canadian abolitionists to send back to help the work in upstate New York and to help people with the Underground Railroad. Um, yeah, they left, especially anybody who was well-known, mm -hmm. as I said. Uh, in, in Syracuse, Jermaine Logan was the most well-known fugitive. Frederick Douglass, of course, had a national reputation, and Harriet Tubman also. Uh, had a national reputation, so they all left. Uh, they, they all knew they were prime targets, and both their African-American friends and their white friends said, just don't tempt fate, just leave. Here, I'll give you money, you know, just get go, just be safe. So, and many, many more African-Americans who had settled in Rochester and Syracuse and Buffalo made a permanent move to Canada at this time as well. They did not want to be taken, and they did not trust the American government. And so many un lesser known or unknown uh, everyday people just packed up and moved and went permanently to Canada at that point. And the communities uh, like St. Catharines and Kingston um, were adopting, were, were not only taking new fugitives, but they were taking long established folks um, who crossed the river. But one guy who did not leave, because he didn't think anybody was going to pay any attention to him, and he liked his job and he liked his life, was a guy named William Henry. Everybody called him Jerry. He was a fugitive from Missouri. Um, most likely had been settled in Syracuse with the assistance, in fact, of Jermaine Logan. Um, 
and he was a furniture maker by profession. And at the time of the anti-slavery convention, October 1st, 1851, he was working as a cooper, a barrel maker. That's a very skilled profession. And uh, he bounced around a couple of woodworking shops um, <coughs> because in the first one he was at, the workers were prejudiced and they wouldn't work with him. And he left and found a, um, another shop where both the, not only the owners, but uh, the guys he was working with accepted him and would uh, treat him fair. So he, and he's at work one day. Cops come in, Syracuse cops, not federal marshals, Syracuse cops come in and say, Jerry, uh, somebody thinks you've stolen something. We've got to arrest you. And now, Jerry has not been a choir boy, and he'd gotten into trouble with the law sometime earlier, or something about a woman and a fight and a few things. And so he'd had a little experience with the law, and he says he knew, he knew what to do, which is that you go with them, you don't cause trouble, and once you get down there, they'll let you talk to a lawyer, and they'll let you talk to somebody, and you can explain your side of the story. And this justice system in Syracuse was known for being really, really fair. He knew if he didn't do anything, he had nothing to worry about. That he just needed to explain the situation, and you know they they let they take you know they let it go. Of course, as soon as he gets out of the shop, he sees the federal marshals. Now this is well planned, long thought out by the federal marshals, and they've got federal marshals from every upstate city, from Vermont to Canada. They have all come to Syracuse for this one arrest, hmm. and so he is surrounded by armed men. He is put into an open cart to be taken several miles downtown to the federal commissioner's office who's going to hear this case. And Jerry panics. He's fighting. He's getting himself really beat up because they've got him in shackles. But he's still, he's screaming to anybody he sees along the streets as they're taking him downtown. My name's Jerry Henry. They're going to take me back to slavery. Don't let them do it. And he's just screamed himself hoarse. And he's just going bonkers. Poor guy, he's so scared. And they get him in there, and so, but somebody hears this, runs into the slavery convention, and some guy's up there giving some big speech, and they've got everybody riled up, and the guy basically shoves the speaker out of the way, gets up to the podium and says, they've taken Jerry, Jerry Henry the Cooper, they're going to take him back to slavery, and everybody's like, no! And like, are we going to let them do this? And they're like, no! And uh, so very quickly, two of the leaders of this convention, one was a lawyer and one was a white mm -hmm. pastor and a white lawyer, they ran down to the uh, office to provide legal assistance and spiritual assistance to Jerry and try to calm him down um, and not make himself any more injured or worse or sick than he was. And in the meantime, the anti-slavery convention <laughs> forgets their normal required speeches, and they start planning how they're going to spring Jerry. Helped a lot by one of their leading members, a Mr. Wheaton, who owned a hardware store for a lot of construction hardware, and he says, you know, usually my sledgehammers and axes, and I have a lot of that out on the porch so that my customers can see it and come in and buy it. And he says, I really don't have time to take them all in tonight. Would you all guard them for me overnight and take them home with you? <laughs> and they did! <laughs> and they brought them back nice and good the next morning so he could sell them. In the meantime, that night, oh, and in the meantime, Jerry sees a break and he runs for it during the middle of the hearing. And he's running down Water Street in Syracuse in shackles. And it, it always seems to me like a sign from like. Forrest Gump, you know, run, Jerry, run. <laughs> and, and, and the citizens who have heard what was going on, they're actually trying to block the way of the cops and marshals so that Jerry can get, you know, get, but Jerry trips. He's in shackles, he's exhausted, he's very, very bruised already. He's mentally just a mess. He trips and he falls and they catch him. They bring him back. And... At that point, there's a huge crowd demonstrating outside, and the commissioner says, you know, we're going to just postpone and wait till the next morning. The, 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 you know, Jerry's in no shape to, to do this. No, nobody is. And it's the end of the day anyway. It's already like 5 o'clock. So, so that night, a group of white Syracusians, now the black Syracusians had all been 
uh, it, what, you know, they all stayed home because they are in danger. And they were basically told, you know, you don't need to put yourself in any more danger. You don't need to do this. We'll, we will do this for you. Even freeborn black people, presumably. Were well, anybody watch 12 Years a Slave? Yes. yes, freeborn black people also were at equal risk with fugitives. And uh, Solomon Northrup was far from the only uh, freeborn black man who was taken to slavery. He's just one of the only ones who ever got out, which is why he was able to write a story that that movie was made from. So they bust, so a, a mob of several hundred white Syracusians <laughs> that night bust Jerry out. And the question in their planning is, but where do we take him? Because, you know, they're all breaking the law, and the fugitive and the federal marshals are all going to be very ticked off and, and not wanting, you know, not wanting to get beat by a bunch of uh, radicals. And a man came into the meeting and stepped up and said, take him to my house. And they looked at him and said, your, your house? You are the leading opponent the abolitionists have in this town. You are one of the main people behind everything that opposes us. And he says, yes, I am. I think your politics stink. But I will not see a man be taken back to slavery. I disagree with your methods, not your ultimate goal. And they will not look for him at my house. And they look at him. He says, I am not going to double cross you. I give you my word. He will be safe. And they trusted him. They knew who he was. They knew he was a good man. He was an honest man. He just they had different politics than they did. And they took him to this man's house where they arranged for a doctor to come and treat his bruises and his cuts and make sure he was going to be okay. They got him, you know, some clothes and some good food. And he stayed there for a couple of days until he was in a, mentally much better to be able to escape. And they snuck him out over the man's back fence into a waiting carriage and got him to Kingston, Ontario. Uh, Jerry died within a couple of years in Kingston, but he did die a free man. And, uh, and so I want us to think about who was the most Christ-like? The federal authorities? They were following the law or the lawbreakers who freed Jerry and faced prison and fines. And by the way, some of them did get fined. Uh, some of the leading uh, people who got him out themselves had to escape. Um, one well-known one is a guy named Rodney Clapp. Everyone knew who he was because apparently he was about six foot six, shoulders out to here, and today we, we, we'd assume he was playing you know, linebacker for the NFL. Uh, huge man. Ardent abolitionist, well known in the abolition community, and everybody knew who he was because he was just so so big. And he ended up spending, I think, three years in Canada um, until things died down enough he could come home uh, and and rejoin his family. Yes. Now you have the who was the most Christ-like. It made me think of Saint Paul. What does he say? He say, "Slaves serve your masters." He does at one point, and then there's yes, other places where he says there is no slave and there is no free. Paul, as usual, talks out both sides of his mouth throughout his writings. In fact, if you read Philemon, or Philemon, however you pronounce it, I grew up calling him Philemon. He's sort of talking out both sides of his mouth there, because he doesn't want to offend Philemon, but he also really would like him to free Onesimus. Um, yeah, Paul and slavery is, in fact, you go back to Glenn's talk last week. Yeah, you know, you can, you can, you can argue both sides of slavery from the Bible, but the pro-slavery side has a much easier time of it. Because, this, you know, slavery was a fact of life in the Old Testament and in Roman times, and they're dealing with that reality that they have to work around because they have no ability to change it. So, um, Phyllis? Where yes. is this great monument? It's downtown Syracuse, and I don't... I've never seen it. It's really, yeah, it's, it's, right really down, cool. it's right downtown, and it's fairly new. Yeah. It's, uh, I think, about 15 years old. And just the name of it, Jerry Messi. It's <laughs> so touching. And, um, it's like somebody you know. Yeah, and, but Mr. Wheaton the, uh, and a number of the other people who uh, helped Jerry get out that night were <laughs> arrested by federal marshals. Uh, faced trial under the Fugitive Slave Act. 
knowing that there would be a huge riot against the Syracuse, the federal judge ordered that the trial be moved to Auburn. There was a federal courthouse in Auburn at that time, New York, up at the head of the Finger Lakes. What the judge didn't count on was that the station master of the railroad in Syracuse was an abolitionist to give everybody free tickets to Auburn that day. <laughs> there was a huge crowd. The judge was sympathetic to Jerry and to his assistants uh, rather than to the law. And he gave the uh, people, he did, they were guilty, they did, he did sentence them to minimal fines, not a thousand dollars. Just, uh, I think, all of them together, and there was a number of them, it was a few hundred dollars. Everybody who came down to witness the trial had come prepared with cash. They passed the hat, and by the end of, within ten minutes, they had raised all of the money to cover everyone's fines. And paid them that day, and they all walked out of court for a minute. Uh, but it was pretty scary. Um, there's uh, letters from Mrs. Wheaton where she's terrified that her husband's going to spend the rest of his life in jail and a thousand dollar fine for them uh, would have been devastating for their business and for her husband being gone. And she's looking at destitution and yet she supports her husband because he's her husband, but she also supports the cause. She is herself an abolitionist and thinks her husband's a wonderful, brave man and she's you know, sometimes she's, she's, she's fearful and sometimes she's very proud and she can't decide which. Um, which is, I think, where most of us might be. Knowingly breaking the law and knowing you could face a, a stiff penalty is not an easy thing to do. And most people I've read stories of who've really done that, in the moment when they were being so brave, felt like cowards. You know, they didn't feel brave. They just felt like they had to do the right thing. And, uh, and, you know, whether it's assisting people at the border, we've heard trials in the last year for people who nearly left water for, uh, in the desert for those who might come along. Uh, by the way, one guy was acquitted and the people who were found guilty, there were four of them, and a federal judge just acquitted them recently. It was on the paper. Um, I don't know what's going on in this world, but um, I want us to be thinking about when is it acceptable to break the law? Because if you're a northerner, all these people are heroes. And if you're a southerner, they aren't. And, uh, and what guidelines as Christians, and I don't have answers to these questions, by the way, but I think it's something we need to be thinking about, is what guidelines do Christians have uh, to be knowing when to break the law. Because, I, and I just got into this, uh, saw something on Facebook the last night, and they were talking about asylum seekers, and he was talking about, you know, they're just, we're just following the law, they're just breaking the law, and my answer to him was, people who, is, who helped fugitive slaves broke the law. People who assisted Jews to escape the death camps broke the law. When, when in our own lives do we, you know, do we make those decisions? And as I said, I don't have an answer. 